In July of 1860, the Clotilda became the last slave ship to land in America as it docked in Mobile, Alabama. It brought with it 110 enslaved people who had been kidnapped in Africa. The survivors of the Clotilda tells their stories and reveals the impact they had on U.S. history. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. Today, I'll talk with Dr. Hannah Durkin about the survivors of Clotilda, the lost stories of the last captives of the American slave trade. I requested and was provided with a copy of the book, but this video is not sponsored. Dr. Hannah Durkin is a historian specializing in transatlantic slavery and African diasporic art and culture. She holds a PhD in American Studies from the University of Nottingham and a postgraduate diploma in journalism from Leeds Trinity University. Among her many other credits, she also serves as an advisor to the History Museum of Mobile, Alabama, which is working to memorialize the Clotilda survivors. Hannah, welcome to Some Books Considered. Oh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, there's so much in this book, we can only scratch the surface. So before we talk about some details from the book, give us a, a brief overview. What are readers going to find here? So this is about, um, I mean, this is specifically about the survivors of the Clotilda. And the Clotilda was, as far as we can tell, the last U.S. slave ship. So it was the last slave ship to dock in the United States with captives on board and to disembark them and then uh, sell them and separate them throughout Alabama. And there were um, 110 captives on board this ship, uh, probably about seven of them uh, died during the voyage, um, and then mostly children and very young people, an equal number of girls and young women and boys and young men. Now, this was before the Civil War, and it was, however, it was 50 years after legislation had been passed prohibiting this kind of trafficking, and yet, obviously, that law was ignored. What led to that last voyage of the Clotilda? Yeah, so as you say, the United States outlaws its slave trade in 1808, and it declares it piracy, which means it's a capital offence, which means you can ex be executed for it, in 1820. But an illegal trade continues, mostly centred on Cuba by the middle of the uh, 19th century. But unfortunately, these are mostly US-built ships, so there's an indirect US trade carrying on. Now, the Clotilda set sail almost, well, actually, you know, it lands in Alabama almost nine months to the day before the start of the Civil War. Um, and many of the conspirators, those involved in this crime, are associated in, in way, different ways with uh, leading figures in the secession movement. So um, association doesn't prove causation, but there are strong indications that this is part of a wider effort to open uh, or reopen the transatlantic slave trade on the eve of the Civil War. Now, before we talk about some specifics here, I'm just curious about why you were interested in this event in history and why it was important for you to tell the story of these survivors. So I was working on a, a related but a slightly different project on the writer Zora Neale Hurston. And I was actually working on her films because she was possibly the first uh, African-American woman to to professionally hold and use uh, a, a film camera, basically, first the first professional African American woman filmmaker, and she was an ethnographic filmmaker who travelled through the South, uh, recording visually, visually recording, and also documenting the stories of people living in the South. And I was trying to identify the people in her films and match them up to those who were in her, her stories. Um, and so, I looked for some. Uh, was looking at this posthumously book, uh, posthumously published book by her that listed the names of the people in her films. And one of those people was uh, a Clotilda survivor. So Zora Neale Hurston had already interviewed a man named Kujo Lewis or Kazula, who was long thought to be the last Clotilda survivor and the last known middle passage survivor. But Hurston had referenced another woman whose name she didn't, we, we thought she hadn't given, but it was documented in this book, in the back of this book. And so I tried to set out to tell that woman's story because um, her voice had been thought to be lost to history. And then that spiralled into trying to tell as many of the Clotilda survivors' stories as possible. And in your research, you were able to uncover many survivors that people were not previously aware of. 
Yes, so a large cohort of Clotilda survivors um, settled or, or were enslaved in and then settled in Mobile, or just north of Mobile um, in the south of Alabama. But those who were sent further north to the cotton belt of central Alabama were thought to be lost to history. I think there was an assumption actually that the Mobile community was bigger than it was. And when I look closely, I actually realize some people have been listed um, several times were actually the same person. So the group was was probably about 30 people um, or just around 30 people. And so there were more than 70 other survivors. So um, I tried to find them and I found them in clusters, uh, mostly in places like Wilcox and Dallas County and also in and around Montgomery. And as you gave voice to these survivors, it was fascinating to learn that they actually had an influence on our nation's history and uh, work toward equal rights, et cetera, down the line, either either directly or as inspiration for it. So tell us a bit about their impact on history. Absolutely. I mean, there are so many different ways in which they had an influence, um, but certainly in terms of the civil rights movement. So figures that really stand out, for example, I'll try and name two or three. One of them was Booja Moore, who was sent to... Montgomery, she was a grown woman when she was sent across the Atlantic. And she had three children, including a baby, and they were all left behind. And she lived for another 70 years without those children. But she was determined to live the life of a traditional Yoruban woman in and around Montgomery. So she caught a segregated train twice a, twice a week in Mon- into Montgomery to sell wares that she'd foraged around her home. So she's working as a tradeswoman, just as she would have done back home. And she's doing this up until 1925, when her when she's physically no longer to do able to do so after that. She lives until 1930, but she is um, traveling the same spaces as um, as you know civil rights leaders. So she is selling her wares along Dexter Avenue, which is where Rosa Parks refused to vacate her seat for a white man. Um, she also probably knew E. D. Nixon, who was the the man who led the Montgomery bus boycott before um, before Dr. Martin Luther King took over. Over in Selma or near Selma, Matilda McCreer, who was two years old when she was uh, trafficked across the Atlantic with her mother and three sisters, her two brothers were left behind. Matilda McCreer was the longest lived or, she, or the last of the Matilda survivors to die. And she died in January, 1940. And in December, 1931, when she's about 73, she walks from her home 50 miles west of, um, of Selma. So she walks along dirt roads to Selma, to Dallas County Courthouse, to demand reparations. Then, of course, her claim is unsuccessful. The white judge turns her away. But Dallas County Courthouse is where Selma voting rights campaigners later gathered to demand their voting rights at the start of the uh, voting, Selma voting rights campaign and the Selma to Montgomery marches, which of course will lead ultimately to the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And just very quickly, Radoshi, who lived near to Matilda McCree and was the penultimate survivor, she was friends in the 1930s with Amelia Boynton Robinson, who is a leader of this voting rights campaign. And Amelia Boynton Robinson described her experiences with Radoshi as amongst her richest experiences of the 1930s. So she's clearly inspiring. Uh, Boynton Robinson, when Boynton Robinson was a young woman. A young woman. In addition to the uh, text in the book, there are a collection of photographs and illustrations. Tell us a bit about those. So I tried to gather as many photographs of Tilda survivors as I could. Very sadly, there are a lot of um, survivors whose, whose photographs and images we don't seem to have a record of. Um, but those that we do are very revealing about I mean, their identity. Some, in some cases, you can see their facial markings, which identify them as um, as a Yoruban community from Oyo State in present-day southwest Nigeria. And of course, I tried to put in references to the G's Bend quilting community because there's evidence that um, significant evidence that Clotilda survivors were living in and around that community, and that community was long thought to have um, the, this, these unusual quilting patterns that. Uh, you know, defined by sort of abstract shapes and, um, and you know, really colourful patterns, long thought to have been influenced by West African strip weaving, which is where you have strips of cloth that are woven together into a single fabric. The, um, the Clotilda survivors, Oyo State, where they uh, were from, 
has a rich tradition of um, strip weaving. So you have these very powerful connections. And so I tried to convey that um, visually where possible. As you studied these stories and learned about them, I want to go back to that passage you referred to. What were they able to share? What thoughts did they leave behind about that whole experience? So the really shocking, harrowing, powerful um, stories of, of what they went through. Some of them actually couldn't talk about their experiences. So Polly Allen, who was one of the last survivors in the Africa town community in Mobile, he could never tell his children what he went through. But um, Zora Neale Hurston documented in a, in a book length interview that was published only about five years ago, um, the Barracoon. She documented um, the life story of uh, Kujo Lewis or Kazula. And her account is, is, you know, or his account in her book is so powerful. So I try to incorporate, you know, extract from that text where possible. But they're just harrowing accounts of um, of um, the abuse that they endured and the desperation to go home. But also, I think their love for their children and for each other really comes through in these these um, these interviews that that do survive of their experiences. You also account for a a missionary effort that was put together to try to send them back, to repatriate them. What happened to that effort? So what happens is a missionary, possibly by complete coincidence, visits um, Stone Street Baptist Church in Mobile in the spring of 1869. And the Mobile community has happened, just joined this church just at this time. And so this missionary, he's, he's been... Uh, he's been working for the past 12 years. He's he's from Mississippi, but he's been working for the past 12 years in um, Abeo Kuta, which is really close to Oyo State in southwest Nigeria. And he's a fluent Yoruba speaker. He can speak. Um, he's, he's been there for 12 years. And so what he does is he so he gives this talk. He recites the Lord's Prayer in Yoruba. And they can't believe it. This, this, you know, they're back at the back of the church, and they're, they're, you know, hiding themselves really because they don't like to draw attention to themselves as outsiders. But they immediately sort of shriek in delight, and then wait for him to finish, rush up to him, and hoping he can take them home. And he tries, he campaigns, but the American Colonization Society, which had been, you know, sending Africans and African Americans to Liberia, had just at this point run out of money. The, the mobile community had been saving on their own to try to go home as well. But there's just no money for them. If he'd found them a year earlier, then there might have been money. They might have been able to go home. But he does keep trying for a, for a few years. Tell us a bit about Africa Town. So Africa Town is a community that's established when the Africans in Mobile realise they can no longer go home. So they, um, so they basically save up money. They live on subsistence diets and, you know, very basic diets, and they managed to buy several acres of land. And they they established their own church, their own school, and before very long, their own graveyard as well, their own cemetery. And this becomes a really prosperous community. So by the early 20th century, it's a community of about two to 3,000 people. The businesses are black owned. So these are grocery stores. And some of them are very successful indeed. And the most successful business people in this community are the Clotilda survivors themselves. So Charlie Lewis, who's the senior figure in the community by the early 20th century, he's the most successful businessman. And when he dies, Isaiah Kibi becomes the most successful businessman in the community. So these are incredibly hardworking people who work so hard to create um this yeah, this highly effective community. And of course, they're using the skills and knowledge that they have from back home to, to forge this community. The History Museum of Mobile has been working to share the history of the Clotilda survivors, and you've been working with them. Can you tell us a little bit about your involvement with the museum and Africatown? Yeah, absolutely. So I was just there um, the other day, actually, which was fantastic. Um, but I was, so they, um, they've recently opened a heritage house in Africa Town, which has a great exhibition devoted um, to the Clotilda survivors. And at the moment, the wall, um, it, it, the memorial wall to the Clotilda survivors is, is incomplete. But thanks to my work, we're going to expand that wall and, and name as many of the Clotilda survivors as we can. So that's an ongoing going project at the moment. Um, but it's, you know, it was just great to be there and to um, spend time with descendants and to hear about 
to hear about their own actually hard work to make sure their ancestors' stories had been told. Because although I, obviously I've written this book for some of them, they've been campaigning for years to to get that recognition. And um, they've been running, I was there for the their annual Spirit of Our Ancestors Festival, which has been running, I think, for about six years now. This might be the sixth um, festival. But this is a real attempt to, you know, spotlight the community uh, because of, it's an ongoing struggle, I think, to get that recognition and to to ensure that the community benefits because the, the you know the economic struggles and also very sadly the the way in which industry has been allowed to take over that community and, and pollute the the community and uh, make it a very unhealthy environment for those living there. There's so much more in this book that we didn't have time to talk about. What would you say are some of the key insights that you hope readers will take from the book? Yeah, I hope people get a sense of just how, you know, how incredible the Clotilda survivors were. And of course, because there are so few firsthand accounts of the Middle Passage, the, the, this community speaks for so many uh, Middle Passage survivors. They speak for the 12.5 million uh, who, were, who were trafficked. And of course, only about 10 point, you know, more than one, one and a half million people died on that voyage. And, um, and also, and a women survivors' stories are almost completely lost to history. But also, I hope that you know the people reflect on what humanity is capable of. Uh, they reflect on the worst of humanity, but also re- able to reflect on the best of humanity through the survivors. But also, I hope that you know if there are descendants out there. You know, I hope this might be a way in for them to make those connections to their heritage. Because I was identifying survivors as I was going along, so. And some of those survivors, individual survivors like Matilda McCrea, have hundreds of descendants. So it's possible there are hundreds or thousands of people who don't yet know that they can trace this heritage and they can trace their ancestry back to West Africa. To learn more, the book is The Survivors of the Clotilda by Dr. Hannah Durkin. Hannah, thank you for talking with me today. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. If you'd like to purchase The Survivors of the Clotilda, I've placed a link for you in the description below. And if you'd like to see more videos about books and their authors on a wide variety of topics, be sure to subscribe, like, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered.